hey, before the fire, you need to know how to make it. Again, simple slab techniques, pinch forming, and coil building. I'm Professor Stephen Robinson. Hope you enjoy this. All right, so there's like so many techniques, of course, that you can use to create the work you want to make. The objects that you've chosen might not employ all these techniques, but I'm going to throw some techniques at you. The first one is a real simple one. And remember, a ball of clay with a hole is kind of the start, you know. So you have a ball of clay, and it's any given size. This could be smaller. This could be larger. If it's larger, maybe I don't use my finger as much as my elbow to start that hole. Um, some people will use their knee. But if I just take a ball and I start out, and I stick my thumb out to show you what I did, I st wow, oh, magic, right? It's a real simple technique, but... Um, so I know it's like, why am I showing you this? Well, as it gets into it, as I turn that ball, again, if it's smaller or bigger, um, the more I gently pinch it. And this kind of pinch forming technique can be more than just pots. You could think about a pinch pot, which is what, what I'm doing here. But pinch forming, as I start to thin it out, again, that's still too thick, right? So we want to make sure... If I'm gonna do a lot of reductive work, maybe I can thin it out by doing reductive work, but we're going to do that expansive kind of work. I'm gonna put both thumbs in now. I'm gonna slowly turn it and pinch it gently and gently and gently. You know, not, you don't wanna pinch it too hard. You wanna pinch it uh, at a certain um, pressure. You don't wanna just kind of just touch, 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 but, uh, as I do that, you see how it's opening up, it's getting thinner and thinner in this form. It could be a big nose for a huge clown head. It could be a variety of things. It could be the roof to a building if I carved it and uh, made it uh, thinner that way. But I have to keep thinning it out. The point being is like, if I'm gonna thin this out to the point where I can do just very little reductive techniques, that's fine. If I'm going to do any additive techniques where I'm going to take a slab of clay and score and slip, and again, I'll reiterate uh, what scoring and slipping is, uh, we have this idea that we can, we don't want to get any thicker than our thumb. And that's so it doesn't crack uh, in the drying also, but it's so you can be efficient with your clay. It's also so when we fire it, we uh, have more success in firing it. But there's, of course, you can make a brick. Houses that are brick houses are sometimes solid bricks, you know, but that's not what we do in um, in ceramics as much. You can, and there could be a reason for that, but I get going and I keep working it. I can think towards what I might want to do. If I get it around my thumb thickness, then I can then have this form that I can square off. Um, I can actually push it into a square like you can see. Oh, I'm starting to square it off. I can triangulate it instead of squaring it. See how I'm making a triangle. Um, keep it round. Whatever you're going to do, these are your decisions depending on the piece you're making, right? And so these are these are some of those things that you can sort of ask me. You know, what what do you think I should do? Um, so that is just the first technique uh, I want to show you. Real simple technique, right? Where I can go from this, I will show you a little bit more about reductive techniques on this. So if you have a wire from your toolkit, you can also use fishing line or other things that you can then also do reductive techniques. So the wire is the first thing I'm gonna show you. If you have something that's kind of a little thicker, I can think about how the wire can be a carving tool to carve at it. So I'm gonna just draw the wire through it and you see how um, the surface of this starts to become more cut-like. And if I wiggle the wire, it does something different. So you see the little wiggle. That's one way. If I have a wire um, that has crimps in it, those crimps are going to show up. And I can look at how I can cut it. You're going to cut through yours sometimes, and you may have to start over but I can start cutting it to create a facet on it or a flat spot on it. 
um, that's one way to carve at it. You might want to leave it a little thicker than your thumb, obviously, if you're doing a lot of reductive work. Remember that, okay? So there's also a tool like where you can get a cheese cutter that already has a wire sprung. I took a notebook, a spiral bound notebook, and I pulled that wire and let's see what that does. I'm not sure how this will work, but sometimes this works really well. So I'm gonna pull it through. And the mark that that makes is sort of something to play with on a different level, right? Um, so that gives me these kind of grooves in it from however the wire is sprung. If it's sprung less, it'll be deeper grooves. So let me carve this a couple more times with this. So these reductive techniques, um, just something to think about. They may not work for the piece you're thinking about, but i throw these out there for you. Do a little bit more. Okay, so now here what we have is like a faceted area next to uh, these areas that were done that way, okay? Another uh, obvious tool is a knife to cut away at things. So you, if you have a fettling knife, then that might be one way, and let me cut at it a little with the fettling knife, too. You can find videos of Soji Hamada uh, cutting with a, a fish, I think it's like a fish filleting knife. So you know you have other tools, probably even in your kitchen, that might be tools that you can use for reductive techniques okay i'm doing this all i just you know pinched this out for you in, in the in that couple seconds um so it's really wet and so if i use a knife to cut at it when it's wet compared to when it's harder it will be a little different too so you want to think about one of the things that you're going to learn during this course is there are these stages of clay and this particular um, idea here may not work when it's really hard. You'll break that wire, right? The wire's only so strong. At a harder stage, this knife would be more, um, it'd be a tighter line, it'd be a smoother line, it'd be easier. Uh, and then that would be called leather hard. So we're working with a wet piece right now that I just pinched out. But if I let it stiffen up, there'll be different qualities to these cuts. And I want you to understand that through the course of this whole course, there are these different stages of clay. And I'll reiterate this over and over. At this stage, you might try this. At this stage, you might try that, okay? One of the things that you have sometimes are, are these elements that then come off too. Like maybe I would use this as an additive element on the surface for some reason. Um, maybe I'm doing something like, I don't know, what does this look like? Like a furrowed field. I'm doing this, this piece that has some kind of idea around farming. Uh, but, so this kind of element here might be something, or it's a scallop. The idea of these residual pieces that you cut off, I want you to really think about, maybe you could use them, but also... It is clay, so you don't want to just discard it. You want to be somewhat uh, as responsible with your clay so you don't run out of clay, okay? So you need to be concerned with that. So these pieces, if you're going to use them, that's one thing. So I just curled it up into this kind of shell-like thing, all right? But if I'm not using them, I really want to make sure that I get those scraps right away onto and in some plastic. So you need to have plastic trash bags that you're gonna use to keep your clay nice, okay? You, the clay comes in that plastic bag. So you wanna squish it up. If it's, if it's right off of a wet piece like this, this can now be used for another piece, right? I can make a small pinch form out of it because it's not dried out. And so if I'm going to think about um, 
getting the best out of the clay I have and not going to the extra work of reclaiming it and softening it up again, I can want I want to make sure that I'm doing that. So here I have this other form that I made out of just the scraps from that first one. And um, so I want you to think about these ideas so you don't run out of clay, but also you're efficient with your time. Okay, so as though I would actually make this piece um, and really think about it, maybe I like the pinchy, pinchy marks on it. And maybe I'll accentuate that by making it really shown that I have pinched this form and see how these marks can be used um, aesthetically. Um, or I refine it and I make it really smooth. I can think about now attachment and I'll just use this piece here, uh, the first pinch pot piece, to illuminate the ideas around what I want you to think about with scoring and slipping, okay? Scoring and slipping is not always a necessity. When it's really wet clay, you can just use pressure, and I'll do that in the coil demonstration and explain the idea around pressure. But scoring and slipping for these stages of clay, if this would get leather hard, or cheese hard, which is this, this stage in like, let's say for this piece in about an hour or two, depending on how dry it is in here, uh, maybe I would need to score and slip to put this together. So let me explain scoring and slipping. Okay, so you're gonna have to prepare some slip. I have some water and some little pieces of clay that I put in there. And um, there's different ways to approach this. Obviously, if we were throwing, you, you would have some slip readily available but you're gonna actually have to prepare it so you're gonna get some little teeny pieces and just pinch them out of a piece of clay and put them in there and what i really think is the best is a stiff paintbrush so something like this that is not a floppy one but a stiff paintbrush and you're gonna take that and you're gonna mix that up and try and make kind of a, a gooey thing um you know if you have a sour cream container like this um that's the best with a lid and then you make this slip. This slip will be your glue for the course of the course. Uh, you make this uh, slip up and keep that lid on it. So then when you have it all prepared, you don't have to do this again. So you can make, make a little quantity of it or make a little at a time. That's up to you. So what I want is some kind of like gooey substance that I'm going to be able to paint into the scoring line. Scratch, scratch and slip scratch and slip and stick however you look at this you're going to have then that brush kind of filled with that slip okay so that's the first thing is to prepare it you're going to think about these areas of attachment i'm going to then scratch it with a needle tool or knife there are actually scoring tools but you need to score it it's called or scratch it up and you need to do it a lot. So this is this is sufficient. So you wanna do it like that. So you're opening up that surface. And what it's doing is if you have a drier piece at a different stage, is it's opening that up so it can become wetter. So this uh, glue that you use that's in here, your slip. Uh, and again, if you're using a paintbrush, a stiff paintbrush, you're not gonna get it all over your hands and therefore not gonna get your piece all glumpy with stuff, all gooey. So once I've gooed that up with slip, I take those scoring lines and I've softened that area. So the principle is that I've softened that area. So let me show you what is not scoring. So this, your piece will fall apart if you do this, okay? So you need to really do quite extensive cross hatching marks with your needle tool like that back and forth until it becomes open enough to allow that slip to go and then penetrate and re-wet that area, okay? Then I have those two pieces and some people, I, I'm kind of a fan of like not having too much cleanup at the end so the slip will ooze out a lot and it's called um good squish you want some good squish you want to see that coming out so you know you actually applied it 
um, it's a bricky laborer's term from Australia, I believe. So when the bricks come together and you see the mortar squish out, you want some of that uh, slip to come out. And then you know your, your kind of your bricks, or in this case, your piece, they're bonded really well. But sometimes I'll sponge it away too. So I'm going to just use some pressure and turn it until those cross hatching kind of, it's kind of like teeth gnashing just until I also see that squish out along that joint, okay? Um, so, if you can see a close-up, you might be able to see a little squish out there, okay? So, that is uh, scoring and slipping. And that's how you can apply things. If you're looking at the outside of a form that you've created, you can score and slip either another form to it, or a slab of clay to do some surface work. Um, but scoring and slipping is going to be the technique you use to join two pieces of clay that are a little drier than this that wetter clay that you may pinch them out of or roll them out of. In this demonstration, I'm going to discuss um, the ideas around coil building. With coil building, you can find historically and in the contemporary sense, everything from small pots to large pots to sculptural objects to actual architecture. You can find actual houses that are kind of coil built, sometimes with an adobe type of clay where they'll roll out these ropes of clay and build these things. You can look out through Africa and other areas of the world where they may have actually made architecture this way. Um, but all across cultures, you will find um, ideas around coil building. And I'm going to discuss coil slash slab coils, okay? So you have to start out with the base first. Of course, we could say, okay, we have a round thing. You can find something that's round, like a yogurt container or something, and draw around it right away. Or use a compass or other tools to figure out something round. And you can start out with your base being round right off the bat. So that's kind of one approach. And let me talk about a different approach. This is kind of a first introduction to kind of a slab too. Just patting it down on the board until you get it the thickness that you desire. Um, you have that slab already. And if you, you think about that shape that you're going to make, and again, whatever scale, I'm gonna start really small here, okay? So I could think about um, kind of a curvilinear shape. Let's say I'll draw a curve, cut through that, uh, next to some angles, uh, so angular and curvilinear, or you can think about just angular shapes. So if I think about that shape that I wanna make for whatever that object is I'm making, I'm just gonna make something kind of abstracted here, and so I have these angles, and I have this curve. Um, again, different ways to approach the way you use these techniques. So I have the base, okay? That base um, can be thought about as a paper template at first, too. So if it's something really complicated, you could draw it out on paper, cut the paper out, lay the paper on there, and cut around the paper. That would be one other way to do it. So if it was a profile of a face or something, or something that you wanted, something very specific, um, you could think about that. Maybe this is almost um, you know, too simple, but I wanna keep it really simple at first, all right? All right, so I have that base. I'll put that aside on a separate wear board. I wanna talk about how you actually make a coil. So you can make a coil up in the air like this, and it gets flat spots sometimes, and you let it go up and you let it go down, um, use gravity, you let your hands go up it, and you can slowly achieve a coil. Uh, it doesn't have to be a perfect coil, right? Or you can uh, use a board that you roll the coil, and this is important. Now watch my hands. I'm not gonna push down too much, but I'm gonna get some movement on the board so the coil rolls all the way. I don't wanna just go like this, okay? So don't do this. Allow it to roll further. I'm rolling out of the screen, rolling back. So I'm making a point that, you know, you want it to roll. 
Also, I want my hand to go back and forth on the coil as I roll it so I don't just stay in one spot. So don't do this and don't stay in one spot. So watch what my hand does. I'll go that way and go down to the other side. I'm gonna go this way, go to the other side. But I want it to roll as far as I can. That way it becomes a nicer coil, okay? So my hand is traveling from right to left and and my hand is traveling far. I'm not trying to use my fingers as much. I am using them to make it roll, but the pressure might be more in my palm if I want to make a nice, even, round coil. Now I'm gonna manipulate this coil anyway. I'm not too concerned about it being perfectly round, but that might be the top of a jar or something. You want it rounder, but um, that's the starting point. I can also do slab work too. So, but I'm going to start out with the idea around coils. So with this coil um, and this scale, I wanted to say, show you like, maybe this is too thick. Yes, it's the thickness of my finger, but if I'm not doing any reductive work, maybe I would make it closer to that pencil thickness. Remember the thickness is uh, no thicker than your thumb and no thinner than your pencil. So, um, because I want to stick to a similar thickness to this base, I may roll it out more. As you get into it, you can also say, instead of rolling it, I rolled it out more, but you can also kind of flatten it and have this be a little bit bigger. So you don't need to score and slip, as I just uh, want to talk about how the clay is at a wet stage to roll a decent coil. That means that it should be at a decent enough stage for you to just use pressure and movement on the coil, and in this case, on the base of the piece, um, as we go up to the next coil, it'll be coil against coil each time. And we don't need to score and slip, okay? So I first wanna put it on there, and I might use my fettling knife to have a, a nice part for it to stop. I wanna put it on there and just use pressure where it comes together here, I'm going to, I'm going to take that little joint there. I'm going to use pressure and I'm going to manipulate the clay on the outside. I'm going to manipulate the clay on the inside. And because this is a smaller piece, I can show you these details, but I'm also going to do the outside and inside joints here and then the outside joint here. And I'm going to make a decision where I'm going to take either the base and take some of that clay and pull it up. Um, and then on the opposite, I like to do the coil itself. So as we get to the next coil, I'll, I'll reiterate that where I'll take the outside of the coil, this coil, pull it up onto the next coil, and the inside I'll take uh, the next coil and push it down. That way it kind of, they kind of fold over, uh, the clay folds over on the outside and then the clay folds up on the inside or vice versa. Just try and figure out the way you want to do it. So I'm going to go through this and I'll, I'm going to just do a little area here and I'll show you what I mean by uh, what I just tried to say. Um, so I did the coil stayed in place and I'm doing the base. You can't really see. Um, but let me show you, I can, I can, it's hard to do it up in the air like this, but you, I can show you what I mean. Like here's the base right here where my thumb is. And so down on the board, I'm doing this where I'm going down to the base and I'm pulling up on that clay, smoothing that out. Now on the inside, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna do the opposite. Let me try and hold it up in the air and see if you can see this, this joint right here. You can't really see cause it's, um, it's hard to see in here, but I'm going to take the coil and meld it on to the base. So I got to do that on while it's down on the ground or on the board. So I'm melding that down in there and I'm trying not to manipulate the coil too much, especially if you already have it thin. And now you'll be able to see the joint. I'll get my finger out of the way. I'm going to meld it back and forth and, and fix that joint and you'll see that this right in here 
that's all sealed up. You don't see the joint anymore. You see the joint on this one, but you don't see it on that one. And you see the joint on the outside here, but where I've manipulated this joint, you don't see the joint. You can see where I've pinched it and stuff. And now I'm gonna, sh after I get a few coils on there, I'll show you how to smooth that out with the sledding process uh, with your rib, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just try and make this grow a little so you can see it, so you don't have to watch paint dry here in this video, all right? I have like so many coils and you can see where each coil is joined. We'll talk about how to remove all of those uh, marks from joining the coils, but it shouldn't you shouldn't see any joints in there. So you wanna make sure that there's no joints uh, visible. But then I'll talk about how to remove those. Again, don't hold your piece up like this. I'm just doing this for a demo. Keep it on a board that you can spin it. You could do that on a piece of cardboard. But to go up quicker, I wanna show you a different technique. And this again is only to go up straight. As you can see, this is going up more straight. If I am going to go outward or inward, this may not work as well. So I wanna um, say that smaller coils are better for some things and then this technique is probably better. You still roll out a coil, but you make it a little thicker. You want it a little thicker so then when you, you can just kind of gently pop it down until you get it uh, the actual thickness of the walls that you're wanting. So I have it about the same thickness now as the wall there. Uh, but what that gives me is basically two coils. You could even do it so it's even bigger. But that gives me two coils. That's one less joint to worry about and manipulate. Um, so let me show you. You still put it on top of that next one. If you want it to go outward more, again, you, you put it to the outside. Um, but and you still want to think about where it ends. So you have that idea. Um, where it ends, you still join it up and keep that thickness the same. You don't want to really overlap and have it too thick. Um, you want to cut it off like I did there. But now I have it on top. Now I'm going to do all those same things and I'm going to join that in the, where I'll take that one, um, one joint now rather than two or three, depending on the size of the slab coil that you create. So I'll be working that inside and I'll be working the outside joint. I'll get that all smoothed up and I'll show you the next um, thing that you wanna do. Okay, so now you see like that's just one joint compared to how many and it's the same distance. So it's a little quicker because um, it's less joints to work. Now, how do I get rid of all this surface is what I wanna bring up now. Um, just to make it strong, whether you're gonna do reductive work on it later or not, which I'm gonna show you. I made this a little thicker it's like a little uh, thinner than my finger, but I want to thin it out and make it kind of light. Um, again, you can make it as thick as your thumb and down to the thinness of a pencil, but I wouldn't go too far. But I'm going to show you reductive techniques with this one. But how do I meld that and make it not look so overworked and pinched and all that? Maybe you like that mark, and as, as you saw in the pinch pot, maybe there's a pinching technique that you like as the surface, and we'll talk about that. How that reflects the object that you're making, that's uh, something you need to think about. But what I want to talk about is uh, what's called a sledding technique, and you use a rib, and this is a wooden rib. You should have them cleaner than this because uh, they, they don't work as well when they're dirty. A, a metal rib, this has um, some teeth on it on that side. There's this metal rib that comes in the kit, and then there's these plastic ribs that I like too. All right, so let me show you how to use these ribs now. I, I again, like, I like them all for different things, but basically, you see the angle I'm holding. I'm not gonna hold it like this unless I wanna cut something off. I'm gonna just do sledding across the surface. I'm gonna use the, if it's a straight um, up wall I want, I can actually use the right angle on this wooden rib. And so that might be one reason. And I might use my fingers on the inside. So I'd be pushing on, pushing against the fingers on the inside. And I'm going to slowly work it. I can work it that way. I can work it up too. Um, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that with this rib first to really manipulate that clay. 
and I might use a metal rib neck. After I've gotten a certain point here, again, I might switch to a plastic or a metal rib. Okay, again, always with the sledding technique, never cutting into it on an angle like this and definitely not going this way, okay? This will um, be a way that it'll hone it up and smooth it up, right? Again, I can go like this and with these, they flex and with the um, plastic ones, they flex too. So I can go around curves with these. Um, and it, it, you know, every tool has got its place. So, so I'm, I'm going to do that and hone this up and I'll show you the surface all around and show you what happens then. I've honed it up a little more. And again, it's like looking at all of those kind of imperfections, you can sled them out with your rib. All right. Want to get the angles going more on this piece. I'm going to maybe tighten it up more. I might use again, more of a straight edge for that. This is all fine and dandy for some form that's going to go, you know, straight up. You're making a form that's going to have more straight walls. What if it wants to go outward? If you want to make a form that goes outward. These are the areas where we start thinking about how far can I go before the piece collapses? On coil building, um, if you're working with wetter coils, you're going to have to stop at some point and let these coils get stiffer so they hold the weight of the coils that are on top, okay? If it's going outward, we have more ideas all around like um, gravity issues that come into play. If it's coming inward, you could virtually make a piece that's almost six feet tall if you just keep going inward with wet, wet coils. This is a stronger structure, right? But if it's out like this, it can flop on you. And there's different ways to think about exterior armatures like uh, a Coke can with a ball of clay or something that holds it while it stiffens up. But you can go into the idea around timing, and timing is of the essence when you're making a piece. You don't want to get all this work done and have it all collapse on you, right? So maybe I would say a minimum um, you should go is like 10 inches, and a maximum should be 15 inches before you go. But if it just fans out, that's too high. So Every form is going to take on different challenges. Um, how would I make the form is the question. These, you've seen me put these coils and slab coils directly on top of that other coil. The simple answer is I would put the next one to the outside edge. With this one, I'm going to just have it kind of come in and just close up. And I'm going to show you that because I can get that done quicker. Um, the idea around timing, if you're going to have some form go out, you are going to have to take some consideration into what I just said with gravity. Um, but I have this edge here that I can keep wet. I can wrap that edge with plastic. I can cheat and, and cheating's okay a little bit uh, using a hair dryer to stiffen this area up so it gets strength. Um, but you, you want this edge to stay that wet clay. So you can wrap it with a uh, saran wrap um, or plastic, um, your plastic bag would work too. But you really want to keep that from drying out so you can put the next coil on it. You can also let it dry out to a certain point with that plastic on it where you have to score and slip and see the ideas around scoring and slipping that I talked about in the first um, demonstration with pinch pots. You could score, now you can score and slip and add a coil for that next coil until you get so far. And those are different ways to play with some of those first techniques that I um, exposed you to. But for now, I'm gonna roll out a coil. Again, taking all that into account. And if I'm gonna make it go inward, I can't really do those slab co coils too much. So I wanna make have a really, a coil pretty close to the uh, diameter that I'm looking at. Maybe I'll make a little bit of a slip. I can't make it like four coils. Because making it go inward, you want to be able to control each coil and where it's attached. Making it go outward, the same thing. 
you can you can get away with some kind of slab coil and it will certainly work but if you really want to control it think about that so so when i attach it maybe you can see i'll show you a close-up so you can see you can already see that i'm attaching it on this angle I'm making it go in can i make it go straight across sure um, but i'm going to have this just curve up to this point up here and then be an enclosed form for this abstract shape i'm making so all the other things come into play it's the same exact process where i'm going to again manipulate that outside coil down onto it and manipulate it up onto it and just kind of work that joint. So I'm gonna do that and I'll show you the next couple steps. Okay, you can see that it's starting to go in more. You can see how it's curving, how it's coming in. So I'm adding each coil to the inside and you can see all the areas where I've joined it. Again, manipulating that and getting those out. We'll discuss different ways for that too. See so yeah, how it's going up now, and you see how it's getting closed in. It's now, what do I do? How do I close that in if I want to close this form in to make this hollow form here? Um, I can't really get in there to join that interior seam anymore, right? Uh, maybe I could go a little bit farther, but what I propose is to think about using a pinch pot technique to make a form and score and slip and join it. And that's what I'll do. I'll just make a form that'll go over that with uh, some kind of pinch technology. So you're just pinching that out, thinking about the form that you want, and only having one area that you may score and slip to put on there. So I'm going to pinch that sucker out. I'm thinking about the form I want. I want this just to kind of keep rounding out at the top. Uh, if you want to just flat, you know, it'd be easy to just make a slab, patty cake a slab, put it on there. It all depends on what you're making, okay? So this is where you start to understand that, like, not all techniques can be used 100%. Maybe they can, you know, but it all depends on what you are making. So when I start thinking about how I make a form that would do what I want just in my hands, that would be one way. So I'm going to score and slip. Uh, so that joint is pretty tight, and so let me reiterate that a little. I'll score, make sure that your score lines are really cross-hatched. Um, have your slip already. And even though this clay is really wet already, because this is coil consistency clay, I still want to open that up to try and get that area without having to manipulate the clay and using extensive pressure for that. Um, go ahead and uh, put that slip in that in those score lines. And just like any time you score, like manipulating it, moving it back and forth, Till it really bonds and now I still have this joint here to fix so I'll do those same techniques but now that it's got a little slip on it it's harder to manipulate so I may like sponge that off dry that off and then do that so I'll do that and then I'll show you the some of the final ideas There's so many different ways to work the form of course um, I like to use a little paddle sometimes too um, and you can tighten up areas you can manipulate it uh, this, is, of course, is uh, a simple tool that you can make out of a slat of wood, um, but, you know, you can just use a 2 by 4 but you got to be a little more gentle with it. Um, but I can, like, see, I left, I left this little kind of imperfection there. Let me talk to you about how you can, like, hone up the shape like that. See how it's starting to disappear? Um... Sometimes you can rock the paddle on there too. Roll that, rock and roll it a little. 
if the clay is too sticky, you gotta flip it over sometimes. You notice I just flip the paddle over. Now this, um, this piece has, this form here has been sealed up, right? Um, so I showed you that with that top part. It's sealed up. That means that there's air kind of pushing back. If you paddle something that isn't sealed up, you can get in there and it's called a paddle and anvil technique that you can employ. Um, so sometimes you have a, the opposite curve or, or a flat, another flat against a flat, and you can really tighten things up. This does a variety of things, not just in the shaping process, but really strengthens uh, some of your joints if you do it right. And doing it right is kind of not hitting against the joint, but hitting down on it sometimes. And you can manipulate the clay a little that way. So, um... I will paddle this and do a little bit more work on it to get this this basic kind of whatever abstracted form I'm working on here. Uh, again, starting with a drawing first is helpful and then you kind of do what's in your mind's eye on paper first and then switch it over to the clay. Um, so I'll do a little more on this and hone it up and I'll talk about some reductive techniques too. So one luxury you have, it, you know, it's spring. If you can get outside and work outside, um, you can find a place on the lawn or table outside and you can work outside. One of the benefits is also a drawback. The sun is gonna dry things out quicker and you can kind of get to certain points quicker. Um, so the drawback on that is if it dries it out too quick, some of your joints may get stressed out from going just drying really quickly. It's the same thing that I brought up. Yes, you can use a hair dryer, but you want to be a little cautious. So uh, this has gotten kind of honed up. Um, and I've done it all with paddle and ribbing, uh, sledding techniques with ribs. Um, if you really want to go on the reductive side, there's these tools. If you can get to the hardware store, they are called Sureform Rasps. And this one you can draw across and you can do a lot of honing up of a shape with this. Um, they make them in flat, they make them in like a celery shape and they make them in these curved ones. You can get just the blade and just hold it in your hand. You don't need the handle. And then you can buy some that are specifically for clay. Um, but the Sureform Rasp would be another way to hone it up in a reductive way. So all of this has just been expansive and additive techniques with adding the coils. So there's a variety of ways to think about it. Um, and each piece is gonna call for something. If you want really hard edge lines, you can paddle it and I'll show you. It's still really wet. Um, you see there's a pretty sharp line there where those coils had come together, okay? So you can do that. You can paddle it in the hard edge lines. Uh, so you want to paddle at, uh, at different stages too. Right now this is wet. I just made this just a minute ago with you. Uh, so not a lot of time has passed. So I'm paddling it. Uh, and again, there's air inside it. If you do go to reductive techniques, there are those different timings that you want to think about. If you ever use this uh, Sureform Rasp technique, if you're reducing it with this, this will just clog up right now. This won't work at this wet stage. So you want to do this at more of a leather hard or cheese hard kind of. And you've grated cheese before probably. If you grade, grate some cheese and it's like really gooey cheese, it doesn't work. Same thing here. Your kind of grater will clog up. So be aware of that too. Once your piece is finished and you've refined it, again, I talked about these. If you go from the yellow to the red, you can keep honing up that surface till it gets super slick like that. But again, once you have a hollow object, you do need to make sure there's a hole in it. Even if it's just a, a small hole like that, like a needle tool hole, you need to allow the air to get out. Otherwise, your piece will not survive the firing. All right, now let's get on to how people have used these techniques 
and other techniques they've employed too. But, you know, you can obviously see a mud dauber, or in this case, these birds making coil pots. We'll talk about coils and pinches and different ways to manipulate the clay. Throughout the world, uh, through architectural elements, and these are grain storage units, and that was in Mali, through Africa, into Iraq, and throughout um, Afghanistan, you'll find a lot of unfired clay. Quite often, it is, you could think about it as adobe, uh, but quite often it's built with coils and kind of slabs, oftentimes mixed with hay and stuff. These techniques were used for um, pots that were fired also, um, but a lot of times it's an arid climate. In Japan, you can find the Jomon culture um, using rope coils to work. The Tinejas in Spain, these large jars you can see here, these are water jars. These are all coil built. All throughout the world, we can find pinch forming and coil building techniques used for sculptural and utilitarian objects. In the contemporary sense, there are numerous people. This is June Kaneko building large scale pieces with coils. Here he is loading some of his dangos into a kiln. Here's some figurative pieces of his. June Kaneko has built hundreds of pieces with this in scales of upwards of 14 feet. Here's a kiln that he uses to fire his work. Lars Kalimar, who is a Danish artist, I was helping him load this big head into an anagama down in Oregon at the LH project. I was lucky to go see him out in Denmark. This is some of his work here. You can see how he's built that piece. Many artists who work in a larger scale often work in elements like this, and then they put them together after the firing. You can see how the head on this one comes off the body. And here I am with him. You can see the scale of, of, that, of those pieces. They're pretty large most of the time. These are fairly small, maybe three feet. Another artist I really like who uses coils was uh, Don Bendel. And this is a Bendel phone. You can blow into it and make sound. This is Matt Weddle. You can see a large piece uh, figurative here. Here he is working on some more organic forms. Arthur Gonzalez is another favorite of mine. As is Robert Brady. I guess you could say as everybody I'm going to show you here. These are all just amazing artists who utilize clay. Further investigate Patty Warshina's work. She's one of my heroes. Every single artist I'm showing is an internationally known artist here. Michael Lucero is so prolific in his career. You can find some of his work at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Joseph Siegenthaler's work is all around the world also. I'm going to show you a lot of figurative work. Um, so with the ideas around the figure, the coil is really great to manipulate. You know, if you're doing architectural work, you might employ more slabs. Doug Jeck's work is pretty amazing also. Uh, most artists who work in the field don't just use one technique also. Wesley Andrig uses coil building quite extensively, but he also uses the pottery wheel. I have a beautiful cup of his. Robert Arneson, an amazing force during the funk art movement in California, did a lot of portraiture work, but did work that was primarily figurative, um, sometimes of people he looked up to and sometimes of people he did not look up to. So his work was heavily political, sometimes poking fun at war. Um, in the end, he was focused on a Jackson Pollock piece. This is the last piece he did. Ken Price, another amazing artist in the field. I love the surface work that he did on his work. Um, you see quite a bit of depth in it. Viola Frey, prolific beyond belief, the amount of figurative work that she cranked out during her lifetime and the scale of the work. You can see the elements, like how this arm comes together there, 
or where the grandma comes together at the waist or the, the businessman in the blue suit. You can see sections. I believe that businessman might be 12 or 13 feet high. Thomas Bartell, another favorite of mine, uses coils extensively. This is one of my favorites of his. Sun Koyu, another uh, artist working on a larger format. Again, look at the equipment he has to work with. Oftentimes pieces fit together also. I love how he glazes the surfaces. David Regan employs a lot of black slip over a white clay. It carves back through it. A lot of brushwork too, I think. These are actually utilitarian pieces, soup terrines. Alan Rosenbaum. And Rudy Audio was just an amazing person. Made tons of work like this. Um, as you saw from the first image, uh, a lot of large scale pieces. Eva Huang, beautiful surface work. Ron Nagel employs a lot of different techniques in his work. Very small pieces, generally speaking. The glaze work is just exquisite on these pieces. Sergei Ispov's a great figurative artist from Estonia, lives in Massachusetts now. You can see as he's building an element of this piece. He's looking at the drawing. Again, what I said, drawings are your main source. Plan out what you're doing. So here's the piece. This is barely fitting in the room there. Um, his smaller pieces are sometimes just slab work. You see a lot of slab coil work that goes on in his work. Chris Gustin, quite a bit of coil work. Uh, these are all Anagama fired. Arnold Zimmerman, a lot of large scale pieces. You can even see how coils may be employed on the surface of the work. Carving. Graham Marks, these pieces are fairly large scale pieces also, about three feet in diameter sometimes. This is Virginia Scotchy. Love her glaze work. This is Scott Chamberlain. Amazing form work also. Of course, in pots, you can think of Maria Martinez, Popovi Day from the Four Corners area. This is a Gail Kendall piece. Master Ongi Potter Vikangyo. Great guy. Um, you can see how he, he uses a lot of people helping him work on his pieces because they're so large. Um, so coil built, paddled, anvil techniques. That thing he's hanging is a charcoal burner, so it heats it up, allows him to work quicker, puts it inside the piece sometimes too. You can find a great video YouTube, um, just type in Lee Kang Hyo, and it's on Goldmark Videos, you can find that. There's a guy in China making a, a large coil piece, you can see how it uh, slowly evolves here in these images. We'll also use sledding and kind of, um, you know, paddle anvil slash sledding techniques to get that surface all tight, tightly uh, packed. So the clay has got a lot of strength in each joint, but also, so there's an aesthetic to it. So it starts to smooth it out and uh, work the surface, kind of sledding on this image here. See how this goes up. So I don't normally like to show my work, but this is a piece from back in the early 80s that I did in undergrad when I was probably 19 or 20 years old. It's coil built and you can see kind of a lid. There's a lid on top, so it's actually a, um, a vessel. And it's got black slip and it's carved back through. I still do a lot of figurative work. Um, this is uh, some of the more recent stuff. I've done some recent stuff after this too, but... This is just showing the process of how I work. 
uh, thicker slabs and manipulating it from the inside and the outside. So those two heads, um, they're two separate pieces, but you can see how I um, kind of refine the surface and then look at all the details that I'm looking at um, from the ears to the eyes to the nose to the mouth. And I think planning that out and understanding how you start with it is really important if you're doing figurative stuff. As you get into the details, that's where it's really at. This is um, just glazed the surface so it's like embedded in oil and it's what this piece is about. It's about oil and our lust for oil. Here's some uh, finished images. So I use the coil quite a bit. I use slabs and coils quite a bit to show students. This is a demonstration of some shoes and a boot that I did for some students. So again, as a sculptural technique, the coil technique is one of the one of the best to like unlimit yourself. There's virtually no limitations. So what you want to do is think how you can employ a variety of techniques, of course. Okay, so do more than just get your feet wet. Dive on into this. Have some fun with it. Let's talk. Let's communicate about where you're going. I can try and help you out along the way. Most important is to have a good time.